You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Super low budget kind of thing. I think the biggest cost on most of the productions that we've done uh, has been, you know, feeding the crew or or just a few a few sort of art costs or something like that. When you don't have a super high production value, you kind of have to make the writing good. You have no other choice, right? Hey everyone, thanks for hitting that play button. It's episode 86 of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Before I get into the episode with Bob and Darren, I wanted to announce a contest that I'll be holding for the Dave Bullis Podcast. So what the contest entails is if you rate the podcast on iTunes, send me your rating that on, on the link to the rating on iTunes. I will put you into a raffle to win a Dave Bullis Podcast t-shirt. Uh, these are the same ones I have up on Zazzle.com, but I'm going to send one to the winner of this contest. So again, all you have to do is rate the podcast, send me a link to your rating on iTunes, and then uh, I'll put your name into the raffle. And the raffle will be held at the end of the year, uh, around December the 30th or so, and then I'll send out the, the t-shirt at the start of the new year. Also, I wanted to say, you know, this episode we we talk a lot about making an independent film, and as you know, you're about to listen to to Bob and Darren, all the things they went through while making their independent film. So, when this episode is over, I invite you to share this with at least one person that you know will benefit from it, because these guys just give you a lot of information, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that can benefit from it. So, without further ado, here it is, episode 86. With Borrowed Time Productions of Dara Barman and Bob Woosley. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Everyone, thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Joining me today are, is Bob Woosley and Darren Barman. They have been collaborators through their company, Borrow Time Productions, for nearly a decade now. They've, they're now launching Borrow Time's first feature film, Do Something With Your Life, on the self-distribution platform, VHX.com. You can actually go buy or rent the film, along with a plethora of bonus content, including the 90-minute anatomy of a movie that breaks down the entire process of actually producing this first feature film on a shoestring budget. They are hailing from Canada. Bob and Darren, how are you? Oh, hello there. Very good. <laughs> Very good today. Good thing. You know, I've actually been to Canada a few times. Uh, oh. I was in the uh, Kitchener area. Oh, nice. Okay. What are you doing in Kitchener? Uh, the first times I went up there, uh, I was training with a Kung Fu Grandmaster. Oh, wow. As you do in Kitchener. Yeah. <laughs> As anybody does. Uh, you know, it's a legendary story of a, an American boy who travels to Canada to train with a Chinese grandmaster. Uh, <laughs> and the other times were all just for vacation purposes. Right on, right on. But always over on the uh, on the eastern side of the country, huh? You haven't been to Vancouver yet? Uh, no, I have not, unfortunately. Well, come on over. Yeah, I know. I really should. I really should get more to western Canada. Yeah, yeah, you should get out here and, uh, you know, I remember on your episode with uh, Peter Marshall, he was also kind of trying to get you out here. So anytime you want to come to Vancouver, you've got people to meet up with, that's for sure. Well, you know, what's funny about Peter, he's actually moving to China. He's in China now, yeah. yeah. We, um, we, we, know, we know Peter and we've worked with Peter quite a lot. And uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's a great guy. I was actually just listening to the, uh, the episode that you did with him recently and I uh, uh, love Peter. He's, an, he's a phenomenal guy, a very uh, good uh, film teacher as well. Yeah. Everything yeah. He, he – all his advice is always solid. Yeah. He's kind of been, I think, a bit of a mentor uh, for us because we're kind of in the same same circles and we've worked with him quite a bit. So he's uh, all of – he's just a wealth of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Peter's awesome. 
Yeah, uh, and it's amazing too, you know, how even, you know, we're in two different countries right now, just, you know, how uh, small the the film network is, you know, it is globally, you know, it seems like everybody always knows somebody else. That's oh, true. true. Totally. Totally true. Yeah, totally. yeah. And it just gets smaller, I think. <laughs> it's it's true. It is. You know, uh, for some reason, I have a lot of friends in, uh, in England who've never met each other, but I'm, and I'm always like introducing them and they're just like on the next town over, even though I'm yeah. like, you know, 6,000 miles away from them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's great that people like you do these podcasts and things and I think really knit that network together. Right. So uh, this is awesome. Oh, well, you know, thank you. And I, I try my best. Uh, so, you know, uh, speaking of, you know, I want to get to talking about you guys, you know, you guys have been working together for nearly a decade, you know, so how did you guys end up, you know, uh, sort of meeting and, you know, how did you guys start collaborating? How did that all start? Well, we both went through uh, the Vancouver Film School, uh, but at separate times. Um, mm. I, I went through the uh, the film production program and finished up in about uh, the middle of 2006, I guess. And Bob, you had already finished up your program, the writing program. Yeah, I had taken the writing program there and I'd finished in 2005. And then we kind of found each other in a weird way. Darren, uh, who also does some acting and went to theater school before coming to film school uh came and tried out for this uh sketch comedy group that i was running and so darren got into the group and we were working together he was an actor and i was producing some shows some live comedy shows and then there was a day where he started talking about directing this music video and then i started talking about some writing that i had and then we you know sort of sparked from there and and eventually ended up uh culminating in in do something with your life which which we just launched you know, and uh, by the way, I actually saw that, and it was actually a very well done job by both of you, um, which I which I want to get to in, in just a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I was I was reading your bio. You know, in 2010, you guys made a web series uh, called Bob and Andrew, which was nominated for a Leo Award. So, you know, what was the impetus to to create a web series? I uh, my writing partner Andrew and I, who the show's named after uh, appropriately, um, <laughs> we had been writing a bunch of comedy together, and we we just he also. So he wrote "Do Something with Your Life." I, I produced. I didn't. I didn't write that one. But we, we were writing together, and and I had been going through some life events. I, I had recently sort of come out as as gay, and I I want to kind of work through that. And and so the whole idea behind the web series was just kind of like putting down on paper all of the the strange things that happen when you go through one of those big life events and you sort of, you know, you look back on it as a bit of an observer and you think that was strange. And like, why couldn't I get to that place sooner? And, you know, you just examine that whole thing. So the idea behind that web series was just to try and, you know, make fun of all the, the stupid stuff that you go through during the, that time in your life. And so Darren, obviously, is, as the director of, of Note that I know, uh, directed the, the series for me. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a great time. And, and the Leo Award was really cool. The Leo Awards are sort of the Western Canada Film Awards. So that was a fun time, even though we, we didn't get a chance to, to win. Um, but, yeah, that was kind of the first thing that, that kind of put us on the map in, in the community here in Vancouver. The show also picked up a couple of um, the L.A. Web Fest Awards. Yeah. We sent both seasons one and two to the L.A. Web Fest, and, and it sort of got celebrated there as well. So that was kind of cool. Now, is that all, still online for anyone to watch? Yeah, if you go to YouTube uh, and just search Bob and Andrew web series, I think our uh, the the direct link is uh, YouTube slash BAS one thousand and four. Uh, you can watch it there. Um, we're also gearing up to do uh, a new batch of episodes that are a little bigger and better and and more produced than uh, than the last group. So that should be out sometime next year, maybe next uh, maybe this time next year. We should have that done. Yeah. So. I wanted to ask you know about that web series you know about producing it. So when you when you sat down to write it and you know and to to sort of plan this entire season, did you sort of you know plan it with hey listen I don't want to spend a lot of money I don't want to you know you know maybe we don't have you know all this uh, these locations or all this extra gear. So did you sort of reverse engineer it where you decided hey let's let's shoot this at my house or let's just try to keep it as low budget as possible. We do everything that way. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we're not uh, Darren in particular, but uh, me too. We sort of share this sensibility of not really wanting to wait for something, or not really wanting to convince too many other people about 
what you're doing having merit. We just want to go out and do it. And so with the web series in particular and, uh, and, and do something with your life, we shot the first season of the web series and do something with your life around the same time. Um, so yeah, we, we completely reverse engineered that. The, the whole idea was just to showcase the writing and make the writing as tight as possible as like a comedy sample. And then Darren's just a master at kind of taking, you know, shoestring bubble gum and a couple of paper clips and making it look really good. So one, um, one of the things though, that, <clears throat> that these guys did, when they were writing it was write it really simply. I mean, it's written, you know, it's not written to be, uh, like a genre thing or, or anything super crazy and hard to produce. It was really like, you know, it's a sitcom style thing with a single camera. So we needed, you know, some, we need a home base for the apartment location and, you know, we'd shoot a few things outside here and there. And, you know, the production value in the first, season is certainly a lot lower because I think I was like a one person crew. I think at one point I was running the camera and holding a, a, a boom microphone and trying to slate at the same time and give direction and try to remember to take the lens cap off. But um, <laughs> in the second season, we ended up bringing a few more people out to help us. And we started getting permission to shoot in cafes and other public places. So we kind of upped the production value that way. But But it was still you know, pretty much, um, super low budget kind of thing. I think the biggest cost on most of the productions that we've done, uh, has been, you know, feeding the crew or, or just a few, a few sort of art costs or something like that. When you don't have a super high production value, you kind of have to make the writing good. You have no other choice. Right. So I think that kind of played to, um, what we were trying to showcase anyways, which was the, the writing. So hopefully that, that came through. Yeah. So when you went out to, you know, find these locations, you know, did you, you know, set out to not only just, you know, get it for the one time, it was like a cafe, for instance, did you actually think about, you know, I could build a relationship with, with these pay, these uh, owners that way I could film there in the, in the future? We definitely got that um, with some places. There's actually a couple of places around town that we've shot a number of times, like there's uh there's a local bar just around the corner from where we work that, funnily enough, they're having their uh, their 10 year anniversary, and they've kind of been a a, a fostering place for us. Um, you know, we've had a lot of fundraisers, and we've had a lot of parties and after parties, and and uh, and and events. We're just going to watch you know hockey games and and things like that. So we've had a lot of good times there, and the guys that run the place are are really awesome and let us shoot there from time to time. So yeah, definitely. Um, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg thing because I think uh, a lot of the places that we approached for those locations and even like favors for if you need a bit of gear or whatever else, it's all people that we kind of knew ahead of time. So you had that relationship going in and then the other places that we needed to kind of shore up, you know, if we need a specific place that we didn't know somebody or whatever, then we approached and, and those – those ones are a little bit more difficult relationships to maintain just because, you know, if you're going and shooting a place, you know how sort of um, kind of you have, to, you have to take it over and you have to really worry about leaving it better than you found it. But even so, it's a bit of an imposition, uh, particularly when you don't have a lot of money to pay for these locations. So uh, we find that it's definitely best to kind of, you know, be a person about town and, and, you know, be a regular at certain places. And when you do become a regular, get to know the bartender, get to know the manager, get to know, you know, the barista, whoever it is. And then eventually that'll lead to when you do need something, you can, you can have those people to go to and they, they know you and they like you already. And they, they know that you've spent some money in their place before. So, and they know you're not going to burn their location either. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. You know, uh, there was a place around me that I, I was able to shoot in about, you know, five years ago and it, it was a bar and basically I just went up to them and I found them. Uh, actually, the first meeting between uh, them and I became was was actually through social media. I actually sent them a, a, a message through MySpace. Do you guys remember MySpace? I met my wife on MySpace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how old we are. <laughs> well, I'm glad someone actually remembers it because when I talk about MySpace, they're like, "What? What the hell? What's my- <laughs> what's a MySpace, bro?" <laughs> As a quick little note here, MySpace was one of the best dating sites I've ever been on. Uh, I actually went on more da- uh, uh, dates through MySpace, and you know, Facebook and Twitter. I don't, I don't get to any dates at all. But uh, MySpace I, was like Tinder's grandpa. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, <laughs> 
So it was also good because you work that MySpace angle so they can't actually see me full on. Because once they see me full on, they're like, oh, my God. So. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Well, my, my wife's a musician and, uh, and so she was using MySpace for you know, promoting her music because that was the other thing that MySpace was really great for was you, know, you could put up some music or you know, if you just had a band or a song that you liked, I remember you could set that as sort of like your welcome music to your MySpace page. So, um, so I ended up, I think she liked my blog and I liked her music or something like that. And we've been together ever since. See, MySpace, the best dating site that ever was. And, it's, I mean, and what happened to my, I think I've deleted my account now, but unfortunately – Apparently, there's still a bit of a music scene there. They've, oh. they've retained some of that. I don't know. I'm trying to hear a little bit more about it again. But yeah, I think the social media part of it is pretty much gone. It's over. Yeah, yeah. because yeah, once uh, Justin Timberlake bought it, he it's like an indie uh, music scene now. Wasn't yeah. that just in the movie The Social Network, though? He just played that character. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Napster guy. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. never mind. Different guy. Different yeah, guy. different guy. <laughs> so – you know, as, as we talk, you know, about building relationships, uh, you know, you, you guys ended up in 2003 making a short film. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't even butcher the name. What is the title? Uh, Fidelium. 2013 we made that, yeah. Fidelium, yeah. Fidelium, okay. Uh, you guys know. You listen to the show. I butcher names all the time. So <laughs> That's totally fine. I, I, you know, English – the English language is tough for me. Uh, so <laughs> the Fidelium uh, was, no, was chosen you know, by none other than George A. Romero, uh, George A. Romero for, as the winner of the 2013 you know, Bloodshots Canada Horror Short Film Competition. You know, so how, you know, what was the impetus in creating a, you know, the script for that? Well, it's – the Bloodshots was actually a 48-hour film festival. <laughs> challenge you know like one of these film slams where you don't do a whole lot of preparation before they pull the trigger uh, well you do a lot of preparation in terms of like gathering your team and sure. getting your tools together but you don't know you, you can't don't write the script. script yeah right so they give you an inspiration package with you know a character or a line of dialogue or a prop or something like that and the idea is to craft the whole story using those things in a way that you know doesn't feel like it's been forced in you know it's all sort of organic and and you you write it and you shoot it and you edit it and then deliver it within a 48 hour time frame and um, they're intense but they're awesome and we've done we've done a bunch of those before um, here in Vancouver they got really popular for a few years there was at least two or three of them every year with a lot of the same people here in the film community um, that were doing them so we uh, you know we combined forces and and got our our um, our inspiration package on the Friday afternoon, Friday evening, and went for it. And we, and then Bob ended up writing the script and, you know, we had a team of, I'd say probably about 10 people or so helping with makeup and costume or, uh, uh, some camera stuff and um, a couple of actors on standby ready to jump in and other friends ready to, to take part. And then we just blast through the whole weekend um, as hard as you can to you know rush to the finish line and deliver this, this uh, it's about eight minutes uh, short horror film. And we were, we were really lucky on that one. We, uh, we had a great team. We had uh, helping us produce was Lindsay Mann who I've done four productions who, uh, helped on Charlotte song, which I, you know, that was later on. But, um, uh, and then we had, uh, as our makeup artist on that one was Darla Eden, who actually won a uh, face off that, um, the sci-fi show, the sci-fi makeup, uh, show. So we had a really talented team on that one. Our actors are, are, were really great. And so, yeah, no, that we already kind of have a style of filmmaking that, that suits those competitions. Cause like I say, we're, we're pretty impatient people. So when we do you want to make a movie we do make it relatively quickly so those competitions are great for us and keep us really sharp and they're a really great way to build your network because you get out and not only do you have to build your own team to go out and, and make the movie but at the same time you get to kind of rub elbows with everybody else because you're at the event where they they kick it off and then there's a big screening at the end of it so they're really wonderful events and having george a romero be the the judge that ultimately selected our film as the winner was really cool so did you get to meet george he wasn't in town. No, we didn't get to meet him, unfortunately. But they sent uh, they sent the movie to him, and he sent us this really nice little message, uh, just uh, talking about why he chose our film and, and the, the stuff that he liked about it. So it was pretty neat. That's great. You know, because uh, I know he lives in Canada now. Yeah, I heard that as well. Yeah, I think he's over. I think he's over in, around Toronto. I think mm-hmm. uh, on the other side. Yeah. yeah. 
because when I traveled out to Pittsburgh uh, for one of the Night of Living Dead festivals, they actually had mentioned that, that George was living in uh, Canada now, and they actually did a Night of the Living Dead uh, I think it was either a stage play or a musical, but that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> nice. that's awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't get a chance to check it out, but I, I mean, I, I heard it got great reviews. So, um, but you know, you know, back to uh, you know your short film. Is it available online anywhere for anyone to watch? It is. Yeah, you can. Uh, I think we've got it. I'm not sure if I'm thinking it's a, a YouTube link. I'll look it up um, and, and give it to you here in a sec. But it um, it's Fidelium. I think you can Google, you know, borrow time films, Fidelium, uh, Bloodshots, 20, 2012, 2013, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's like I say, it's about eight minutes long. It's got some wicked, um, some wicked uh, makeup, the prosthetics, in fact, that, that Darla came up up with were amazing uh, actually at one point my fun little anecdote from from shooting was uh, the amount of blood that we had because it's called blood shots you know you got to have a lot of blood and uh, the amount of blood that we had uh, got really overpowering under the hot lights and everybody looking at it it got just so gory that some of the some of the crew actually had to step off set they were like i can't look at this it's too it's too much my brain knows that it's fake but my guts are telling me i got to get out of here but the crazy thing was that all the blood's made out of syrup and under the hot lights it starts smelling a bit like pancakes so mostly i was just hungry during the whole thing. <laughs> quite amazing it was great <laughs> All right, guys, we just shot a horror film. Let's go grab some pancakes. <laughs> yeah, some exactly. breakfast. Come on, let's go. <laughs> you know, so you kept this, you know, this going because you know, in, in uh, September of this of this this past September, excuse me, they you know you supported uh, Done for Productions on the dark fantasy feature uh, Charlotte Song, which actually had I. I win Rian from Game of Thrones, and you know. So, did you want to keep you know working in the horror genre, or was that just sort of like a, a happy coincidence? I think horror is kind of a happy coincidence. I mean, um, horror and sort of the genre of horror, thriller. I mean, even sci-fi. Um, they're they're great genres to play in, and they're they're a lot of fun to make, especially when you're dealing with things like makeup and and effects and things like that. Um, I don't know that it's really what what either of us are immediately drawn to but there's those the other aspects you know in in the production side of making these things that are a lot of fun or that sometimes you can do on a on a smaller budget um and make it really effective you know so those are the kinds of things that we're really excited about but i think also with charlotte song just getting the opportunity to work with someone like i believe it's ewan uh ewan ewan you, you want? You want. He's Welsh, so it's a really yeah. challenging name to pronounce. But to, <laughs> to to be able to work with him and and a lot of the other people that we've worked with and just kind of you know step the whole production up a level. Um, the the production was I think it was about twenty seven days of filming through the through June last year. Um, was a real treat, you know, to just sort of level up in general was great, and uh, to do it with with a lot of the people that we've been working with uh, was fantastic. Yeah, it was uh, Lindsay Mann who who produced Fidelium. She was uh, one of the producers from Done Four Productions, and that her and Jessica Lee Clark Bojan have uh, have that company, and they were they were looking to to sort of really swing for the fences on this film and and kind of you know demonstrate this model that we believe in uh, of not a ton of money but having really talented people and allowing a lot of people to kind of level up and, and do something that they might not get to do on their regular day job because in Vancouver here we've got a lot of service work for LA but we don't have a lot of stuff where you know people get to you know be the screenwriter be the director be that kind of stuff um, it's all it's all sort of labor work to serve you know the wonderful network television shows that shoot here, and I, I love them. But um, but the idea was to sort of gather all that talent together, let people move up a notch, and 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 really make something special, which which I hope we did. Um, but it really for us came down to working with a really talented group of people that that we've kind of through that last decade of, of collaborating together have seen around town and worked on their stuff and they've worked on our stuff and just really continuing those relationships through to what was pretty much the, the biggest and most complex uh, show we've worked on. So that was, that was a really fun time on Charlotte's Song. 
It, you, you mentioned the uh, all of the Hollywood productions that come to Canada, and that's very true. You know, because whenever you know I've been a part of a production, that's one of the things that comes up is those tax incentives, yeah. and they're always you know talking about hey, this is what we have in the states, but if we go to Canada, you know, we also have to factor in the currency exchange. Totally. I mean, the um, <clears throat> the exchange rate's really good for you guys right now. And, you know, I, we've looked at some of the different tax incentives, not that we really qualify for them because we've got such small budgets at the moment. But, you know, we've, we've seen that if you do some really creative uh, math and, um, and production sh- uh, organization, I suppose, um, you can get as much as like 40% or 45% of your of your output back in tax incentives. Mostly it's all labor costs. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's all about like for us to keep our budgets low, we get a lot of people that come out and help us and, and you know, work for for little or no money and get a share of, of our film, right? But uh, But a lot of people, if you wanted to pay, you know, union labor rates, you would be getting 40 cents on the dollar back immediately in return just for employing, you know, British Columbia filmmakers. And you actually just uh, raised another good point too, which is uh, I was actually listening to a podcast and the guest was Dov uh, Simmons. And he actually mentioned that was when if you don't have money, he goes, but you really want to work with certain people, whether it be actors or crew, one of the best ways to to, to uh, get them to on board your uh, production is to actually offer them, you know, uh, some points on the back end, some shares of your film. Yeah, it's true. I mean, that's something that I think uh, if it's your first time putting a film together, um, you know, you got to be a little bit careful with that because you can give away a lot of equity in the back end of the film. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that I think a lot of people uh, do in, in, in another sort of model of things is they hand out a lot of deferrals where I say, you know, you come on board, Dave, and and help me as my DOP or whatever, and I'll pay you half your rate now and I'll pay you half your rate when the movie makes money. But the thing that people need to remember is that, you know, these deferrals and and if you are handing out back end points, if your movie, you know, does do quite well and you end up making quite a bit of money on it, that can really affect the back end of that film or it can make your movie really not attractive to, to distribution to sell it if you know, somebody owns a bunch of back endpoints or somebody owns, you know, there's all these deferrals that need to be paid out. So um, you just have to be careful with that and, and sort of look down the road. And I'd suggest that anybody that's that's thinking about doing that gets some advice. But um, if you're starting out and there's not a lot of money in the budget, I think giving people an ownership share in your movie is, uh, is you know, it's fair because these people are putting their blood, sweat and tears in just like you are. And if you can't afford to pay them, the least you can do is allow them to, to share in the success if the movie does get out and, and make some money. So then, you know, now you've made your feature film, Do Something With Your Life. It's available now on VHX.com. So I wanted to you know talk to you about that is, you know, what was the impetus in writing this script? Well, the – you know, we'd sort of taken the momentum that we'd built with these different 48 and 72 hour film festivals. <clears throat> and um, I guess it was probably by about the time I was about five years out of film school, I had, you know, we'd been shooting a lot of short films or the web series and been doing other things here and there, but really, you know, wanted to, wanted to do the first feature. Um, and, and so I sort of like, I, I'd been working with Bob and with Andrew who ended up being the writer on the film um, and sort of talked to them and our other friend, Keith, who uh, also took the writing program and came on as a producer. And the four of us, you know, I, I somehow con them into coming along on this ride with me. Uh, I think it was in September 2009. I approached them just after my wedding and said, you know, guys, I, I want to make a feature film and I, I would like to shoot it next summer. So let's uh, let's start working on it. <clears throat> and um, I think Andrew had a bunch of time on his hands. Uh, he was recently unemployed or something along those lines. So he had a bunch of time to be able to work on the script almost full time, which was huge. Um, so we started getting to together for, you know, uh, story and and concept meetings at least once or twice a week, um, through the whole fall and, you know, launched, a launched a fundraising campaign by December of that year with the goal to raise about $10,000 
to start shooting at around the beginning, middle of June in 2010. Um, I'd always kind of been inspired by stories from someone like, you know, Robert Rodriguez made his first film for like $7,000 on film. And, and uh, I think after reading his book, I started thinking, well, yeah, I, I think I could probably do something like that. And that would be, that would be a pretty great way to, you know, make a short, uh, make a feature film on a small budget, but be able to potentially raise all the money ourselves so that we're not indebted to investors, um, so that we can kind of make whatever movie we want to. And if it is a good movie, then people will want to see it. And if it's a bad movie, well, you know, it doesn't have to make any money. So that was kind of the start of it, I think. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the movie was, a. Uh a long and arduous journey as, as many indie films are. So we shot through the summer weekends through the summer of, of 2010 for about eight weekends. Uh, post-production was a, was a bit of a challenge and we, we got the movie cut together after about, you know, this was early 2011. We had the movie cut together in sort of a rough, rough cut. And we realized that, you know, certain things weren't working and, and other things really were working. So then we, uh, we basically excised an entire subplot of the movie that was just tonally not working and reshot an entire subplot with, uh, with one of our actors who he plays a different character. We had, we completely cut him out of the movie and then put him back in the movie as a different character. Uh, so we, we reshot that and, and ended up premiering at the, the Olio festival in uh, 2012. And then from there till now, we've just been kind of, you know, having cups of coffees with distributors and talking to people about that kind of stuff and learning uh, a, a lot about, uh, the indie film world. Um, and uh, now we're at this point where we can finally get it out and share it with people, and we're pretty proud. Yep. So you mentioned you you crowdfunded the project. Uh, what platform did you use? We we used Indiegogo, um, and at that time it was there was definitely not nearly as much crowdfunding as there is now. I mean, we didn't even have Kickstarter here in Canada at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, And I see how many different options there are around, you know, North America specifically for for crowdfunding companies. I know Seed and Spark um, and those guys have been doing a lot of indie crowdfunding and and things like this. But at the time, I think the only option really for us was Indiegogo. And our our crowdfunding campaign was abysmal uh, (laughs) compared to what you see for, you know, successfully funded campaigns now we i think we put together a short little video and a couple of pictures and a short little bio on the four of us um you know i don't think we ever really intended for it would have been great to get it outside of our network but i think really what we ended up using indiegogo for the most was for friends and family that weren't here in vancouver and couldn't come to any of our fundraisers to be able to to make a donation we raised a couple thousand dollars through the indiegogo site. Um, but you know, that was only a small portion of, of the budget. A lot of it came from these other fundraisers that we did here at, at our, at the bar that we go to all the time, Jaggers it's called. And, um, and I started picking up a bunch of um, sort of, you know, editing contracts and things. I'd go on Craigslist and find people that were looking for, you know, a short video that I could shoot that was going to be a relatively quick turnaround. Or if other people needed some editing done, I started picking up whatever I could in my spare time to to put all of that money into the into the budget. And Keith, our other producer, you know, even went so far as to we we thought of different ways that we could get other people interested in the film as well and he started doing a bottle drive which is something I don't think anyone's really done since I was in about grade five and I wouldn't recommend it we didn't we didn't make much money for the bottle drive but it was a cool thing because it really kind of spoke to the the will to get the movie made and that was a thing that Darren was mentioning how he somehow roped us into it it really it was just this this madness in his eyes that he said I'm making this movie come hell or high water and you can come or not and so we came along because I think that that's a point that I would definitely like to stress is that, you know, for, for young filmmakers or anybody that's, that's thinking about doing their first feature, you really need that madness and that dedication to say, I'm going to make this movie and, and make it work no matter what. Cause that really was what got this movie made. And that was all Darren. So let me guess when, when you were on Indiegogo, did you have to spend most of your time explaining what Indiegogo was? Because <laughs> I, I had to when I first did it in 2010. It, the the next question at everyone's mouth was, "Wait, what is it called? Indie, it called? 
Yeah, and they were, so did you have to do a lot of explaining about what crowdfunding was? There was a fair bit of explaining, but I kind of I think that we just kind of said, you know, like here's a link, uh, follow the directions, and you can input your credit card details and add as many zeros as you can. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, I don't think it was that difficult. But then we also didn't really have a lot of people going to it. You know, like I say, ours really was friends and family, um, and so. It, it didn't. It didn't take very long to to explain that way. We haven't really done any crowdfunding campaigns since then, um, and I think you know probably for one of our next projects, whether it's the the next iteration of the Bob and Andrew web series or something else, you know, we're definitely going to be putting a lot more work into that crowdfunding campaign than we did the first one because I think you have to, you know. Yeah, very true. And you know, I still get uh, you know friends and even people who find me through the website or the podcast, and they send me links to their crowdfunding campaigns, and it's dead in the water. And they they want to know what happened, you know, and you know, can I give them some advice? And I'm like, well, you have no video, you've got no pictures, you've it's yeah. almost, it's almost like, hey, listen, this is my campaign. You give me money, <laughs> and we'll and we promise it's going to look like something. But totally. um, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen those too. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, and, you know, I mean, the incentives are also pretty important, I think. You know, people want stuff, or at least I want stuff. And if I'm going to film, if I'm going to fund a a campaign, I mean, there's a big part of it, you know, something that I see where I'm like, oh, I'd like to see that. I definitely will help that out, that team out. Or if it's, you know, friends or other filmmakers in the community where you see their campaign, it's like, oh, that's, that's a cool idea. But then also, you know, the other side and, and the thing that I think we got wrong on our our Indiegogo campaign was those incentives. You know, a a lot of times the tendency is to offer physical items, you know, whether it's signed posters or DVDs or T-shirts or whatever. And and that kind of stuff also costs money to produce. So And a lot of time. And a lot of time. And, you know, if you end up sort of promising a lot of that kind of stuff, cool though they are, um, I I sometimes wonder for people that do that, how much of the money do they actually put into the into the project versus Versus into the incentives. And I guess there's a balance back and forth because it does get, you know, more interest or more visibility if people like those incentives. But I'm really excited about the idea. And I've seen a few other campaigns do this. Some friends of mine uh, around Washington and and the Seattle area um, have made a number of of, uh, low budget features now and are using those their past releases as as incentive packages to fund their next projects, which I think is pretty neat because, you know, it kind of gets the the word of their previous projects out as a thank you for, for donating to the next one. So it's kind of like promotional crowdfunding in a way. Yeah. I think it's, it's, you got to get the thing about crowdfunding is too, uh, you know, back when we did that campaign for do something with your life and like, you're talking about having to explain what Indiegogo was. We're not in that, that realm anymore. I think the the game, the, the bar has really been upped in terms of what you need for a successful crowdfunding campaign and people expect it to be part of the story, part of the narrative, right? I mean, you need to, you need to be crafting it uh, in preparing for it almost as much as you would for doing a film. You know, you've got to be generating content and being creative about what those rewards are and making sure that it's a companion piece to your, to your movie or whatever project it's for, not just, you know, a receptacle to get money because people catch on to that pretty quick. So do you think that for your next project, you'll, you'll make another uh, or launch another crowdfunding campaign? We're definitely gearing up to do one. Uh, we're, we're kind of of the mind that, you know, um, when you do do one, you kind of got to make it count. And so, uh, like Darren was saying, we're kind of, we're writing right now the next, uh, batch of scripts for Bob and Andrew. And once we've got those scripts done, we'll kind of assess, you know, what kind of budget we need for that. But I think we're looking at possibly doing a crowdfunding campaign for, for that batch of, uh, of episodes, just because the show already has a little bit of a built in audience. I mean, it's not much, but it's a little bit of a built in audience, some recognition there. We've had some success with it in the past. And so, I think that's that's important too when you're crowdfunding is to show that what you're going to make has some validity to it and people can go and look in, at things and, and know whether or not they'll be interested. So with your crowdfunding campaign for Do Something With Your Life, you know what was your most popular perk level? 
Uh, I think it was probably about twenty dollars, something like that. Um, and for that, they got a copy of the film and a poster, I think. Uh, something along those lines. Yeah, I'd have to take a look again. There was a couple of different things. Again, you know, it was like uh, we were at the time we were going to start making. I wanted to make DVDs because I'm a big fan of physical media. Mm-hmm. Um, Don't ever help Darren Borrowman move. <laughs> I've done it many times, and there's just a bunch of like, boxes and of shelves dead media, and shelves of records, and eight tracks, and yeah, mini discs. Um, the but yeah, I, I think probably around about the the twenty dollar range for for a crowdfunding campaign was was the most popular for us and I I, I mean, we've only just launched the movie online itself um, through VHX, but that seems to be sort of like uh, an average that people that are interested are are willing to pay for either a good cause or maybe it's a lot of content. I mean, our our uh, our film is on VHX as a with a pay what you want structure. I mean, we've got suggested prices um, for the deluxe package with all the bonus material and, and stuff like that. Well, there, there's minimum prices, basically. There are minimum prices, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, but, you know, with the pay what you want, a lot of times people will, you know, give a little extra, which is always nice as well. So, you know, I have to ask the question, I'm sure you've, all, you've, you've been asked a lot, is, which every filmmaker's asked, is, what'd you shoot that on? Ah, yeah. <laughs> every you know, festival you go to, it's always so. You know, what'd you shoot that on? What'd you shoot that? Da- with? Darren's eyes just lit up. This yeah. is the question he loves answering. I most. love talking about <laughs> gear and stuff. This is this is exciting now. Um, you know, it was funny because we shot. Uh, we were shooting the Bob and Andrew web series. We had borrowed a friend's Sony EX3, which is you know an HD 1080 camera that actually has interchangeable lenses, or you you can if you've got the right mounts and whatnot. But we did. Didn't, um, have the right mounts. I think we had two lenses and we were playing around with this camera and shooting. And unfortunately, I think somebody tripped over a cable and the, the camera went lens first into the ground. Um, and that, and I, we had, by that point we had raised about $12,000 through our crowdfunding or through all of our fundraising for the movie. And the first 2,500 or so went into repairing this uninsured camera, uh, which was unfortunate, but also a blessing because it, it made us kind of go, well, this camera probably, you know, isn't going to work because the it's damaged goods now, the lens is shattered. So we need something else. Um, our, our cinematographer, Jordan Ewan, uh, we'd worked with him a lot and he was familiar with those cameras. But he also sort of pointed out the fact that some of these um, still camera companies were coming out with, you know, um, like DSLRs had just started coming onto the market. So he sort of said, let's take a look at this uh, this new one, the Canon 5D Mark II. It shoots 1080 video and um, I've got a bunch of Nikon lenses and all of the um, – the Canon purists cringed when he talked about putting Nikon lenses on a Canon camera, but but that ended up being what we did. Um, I think that was one of the smartest choices we made. Um, having Jordan on board, I mean, the photography in the movie because we we had a tiny crew again, you know, very small budget. Jordan made that that look pretty good, I think, you know, with those lenses and that camera. Oh yeah, for sure. He was, he was fantastic. And, um, you know, between the use of, of the prime lenses that we had and, and, and having the 5d as, um, as much as we made fun of it, because, you know, Jordan actually works in the, in the industry here in town as a second, he was just, you know, he was just in Dubai on the latest Star Trek movie. And he was, you know, he did the monster trucks movie or some big FX show. And so he's wor- used to working with techno cranes and, you know, airy Alexas and just the full gamut of industry gear. So to suddenly sort of have him pick up a, you know, a, a two pound DSLR and go, okay, well, we're going to shoot the whole film with this. And, um, well, and we didn't even have a kit for most of the time. I mean, there were some days where we had, you know, a, a, a kit where we had, you know, map box and you know, no. like a shoulder, mount. a couple of days we did. I, I, we talked oh. about this on the, on some of the special features. And then I noticed in the behind the scenes, there's a map box. There was a map box oh, on wow. one of like one weekend that we had. But anyways, <laughs> most of the time it was just Jordan holding the camera. Like, it really was. It was, there was no follow focus. And you know, if you've ever tried pulling focus on a, on a stills lens, it's like one millimeter equals a distance of, you know, a hundred foot change. It's like, Oh geez, <laughs> the, the depth of field can be so shallow, especially if you're shooting wide open that, you know, it's a miracle that everything, 
everything is mostly in focus. So um, the beauty of it was, though, we were able to bomb around and and get a bunch of shots in public, and people didn't really bother us too much because you know there's all that stuff in the beginning of the movie of uh, Mike riding, riding the bike around, the bike. and you know when he takes transit and stuff like that. We were able to to bomb around with that camera, and nobody really gave us any trouble because it looked like we were taking a bunch of stills, right? So uh, so that kind of helped not having all of the the bells and whistles on the camera. But the huge caveat being make sure your DOP knows what the heck they're doing because Jordan was – Jordan's a pretty skilled operator with that. Yeah. He um, – you know, the, the just the size of the camera itself, for instance, in the opening sequence when we are riding around, you know, a lot of people ask, how did you get that – shot where the camera's right down at his feet and he's riding and it's like a, a pedal foot insert and you know we we um we used a lot of c-stand arms and kind of mounted the camera upside down hanging off the back of a bmx um which you can't really do with you know fifty thousand dollar cameras um so so that was a real benefit uh, of using that particular camera um the the challenge actually with the camera though came in post because at the same time um, you know, we ended up editing with uh, with Final Cut Seven, which uh, famously could not handle H two six four video files. So the camera files that came straight out of the out of the five D, trying to edit those as compressed and and small file size as they were was practically impossible and it just kept crashing my program so i learned a lot about the pop the post process you know even though i had a lot of education in the whole world a lot of things you don't know until you've actually been in that situation so we ended up trans like a terabytes worth of you know 16 gigabyte cards out of the out of the 5d and then editing it all from there so you know, I've had some friends too who've moved away from Final Cut Seven. Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, they moved away from Final Cut X because once X right. came out, they all either moved to Avid Media Composer or they went with well, the route I went to, which is Adobe Creative Cloud, just using Premiere okay. Pro. So, if you were gonna, when you edit again, you know, do you think you're gonna go back to Final Cut Seven, or do you think you would use like you know something like uh, Premiere? You know, funnily, I. Um I was the editor on Charlotte's song last year and we did edit in Final Cut 7. I, mm. I'm not a really big fan of Final Cut X either. Um, and I, I did learn and train on Avid, but I haven't really used it quite as much. And I like the the tactility of, uh, you know, Final Cut or, or Premiere. And I've pretty much switched over to Creative Cloud myself. Um, but last year, because uh, I think I didn't have Creative Cloud at the time, I I was pretty confident and solid still with Final Cut 7. So I ended up using that for Charlotte's song. But, you know, moving forward now, I think pretty much everything I'm doing is is all in Premiere because it's a little bit more versatile, I think. Yeah, you know, I actually edit this entire podcast on Audition, which is a part of creative, which is a yeah. part of the Creative Cloud. In case anyone's interested, as we talk all this techie geek stuff, uh, <laughs> as we get involved, move deeper into this. Yeah. So, so you know, you decided to distribute this movie on VHX.com, and you know, as you were saying before, you know, you talked for you know months upon months with all these distributors. So, you know, what are some of the things that you you took away uh, from having all these meetings with these with uh, these distributors? The biggest thing was if you're going to do a comedy, you need a recognizable actor in your movie. It's, yeah, it's. It's just a fact of life now. Um, we thought that if we made a, a quirky enough, you know, comedy that it would kind of stand alone. And, and the realities of the of the marketplace now is such that you know, all the distributors that we showed it to, they all pretty much unanimously said, "We love your movie. It's a great little movie. You guys are are doing a good job. Come back to us when you have the, either a horror movie with nobody in it, uh, or somebody in it's better, obviously, but a horror movie, science fiction, or." you know, get a star in your movie and, and we can talk. But, um, that was, that was somewhat of a, of a sort of realization that we had to come to very slowly over time. Um, and when we first had the movie finished and we, we had got it to a couple festivals and we had our premiere here, um, self-distribution seemed like a bit of a, a bit of a failure in a way, but with things like VHX and with things, you know, the other platforms, cause we looked at like, 
five or six different platforms, and there's a lot of really good ones right now. And we went yeah. with VHX just because it seemed to have the most versatility for us. But self distribution now, I think, is is a really viable option. And I think for especially for people that are making their first feature or people that are making super low budget features and they can't they can't get you know a star to be in their movie. Plan for self distribution. I mean, you're not going to make a ton of money, but you're going to get your movie out there, and you're going to start building an audience. And I think that that's the thing that a lot of people need to think about as well. Getting into indie filmmaking is that you can't put all your eggs in that first feature basket. That first feature now is almost more like what it was to have a really polished short film back when we were shooting on film. Uh, you know, it was so hard to make a movie back then. You had to, you know, you got a crew together, make a film, a short film on film and get it out there. It could be a calling card. And now I think that first feature really has become your calling card. So I think, I think that speaks also to the way that we do things and just trying to keep things as cheap as possible and, you know, trying to, trying to really focus on the important aspects of the story and, and, you know, the acting and trying to, trying to get some good cinematography in there, but, but doing it cheap and, and making sure you don't owe anybody any money on that first feature so that if you don't make any money, at least you can build your audience and, and build your name and build your reputation and, and hopefully put that as a cornerstone towards your career. I think one of the things um, that that Bob also mentioned that I would I would take away from the whole experience of that of do something with your life is, you know, he said plan uh, for distribution. And that was not something that I was thinking about at all. I've been trapped in the 90s for most of my life <laughs> musically. And I mean, fashion wise, I tend to only wear plaid and grunge uh, stuff. But um you know, I was also thinking about the distribution process in the early 90s and thinking that we could sort of do the same thing. You know, you make a feature, send it to some festivals, they love it, uh, you become the next, you know, Richard Linklater or, you know, Quentin Tarantino or whoever or whatever that is. And and that was kind of the way that things went for a while when, when it was a lot more challenging to make a film because it was actually shot on film and you needed a crew and you needed a lot more money. And I mean, these guys had stars and things like that as well, but you know, I feel like the festivals in the early nineties were a very different thing than what they are now. And when we set out to make the movie, getting it out there and the distribution and everything that comes with finishing the movie was not at all what I was thinking about. My favorite time, of the whole phase is the actual production from when you've got the money or the green light or you you start doing it until you kind of hand it off and you're finished with the end of the project you know it's edited it's mastered and you screen it that's my favorite part and um and unfortunately the getting the money and the selling the movie my least favorite parts are uh definitely probably two of the most important things that you really need to think about as a filmmaker, because a lot of times you aren't, um, and you don't want to, and you want somebody else to think about that for you, but you know, nobody's really going to do that for you. You need to, you need to plan for that yourself. You know, uh, Darren, you made a very good point about the whole horror movie thing. Uh, because I've noticed that at talking to more, uh, distributors, talking to more people who, who teach workshops, they always recommend, a horror movie as sort of like your first your, quote unquote your first film because yeah. horror itself becomes a, becomes the main character. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I mean, look at the top directors, um, you know, in North America right now, and even around the world. Some of the best directors started there, or the the new generations of the people that you're talking about, like the Richard Linklaters and whatever that you're talking about now. It's like. It's Eli Roth and James Wan and right. people like this that all came out of horror. Yeah, you know, they they made their horror movies were their first ones and they broke through with those. And that's that's the thing about today's marketplace is that no no distributor is going to go near your movie unless they know they can sell it. Not they think they can sell it, they know they can sell it. And the only genre out there that they know they can sell without having, like I'm saying, some kind of bankable star or at least recognizable star in your movie is horror. A sci-fi to a certain extent, but horror it really is where it's at for that kind of thing. So, I mean, if you're interested in horror as a as a young filmmaker, I'd say 
by all means dive in. And if you're not, just be aware of the reality that, you know, you're probably going to be looking at a self-distribution model, which is not the end of the world. It's, 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 there's still a lot of really cool ways to do that and get it out there. But again, it takes a, a lot of effort and a lot of planning and that handoff between filmmaker and distributor doesn't really exist like it did before. Cause even when you do get a distributor on board, a small film, it's still really the onus is on the filmmaker to make sure that it gets out there and reaches its audience, you know? So I I think, I think filmmaking is much more a 360 degree proposition than it ever has been. So that's just something I think people should keep in mind when they dive into something like this. You know, very true. You know, uh, guys, we've been talking for about 50 minutes now. Um, So, you know, in closing, is there, you know, anything that you would like to add to sort of put, you know, a uh, period at the end of this entire conversation? You know, I think uh, the the process of making any film is uh, is massive. It's such a, a lot of work, and it's it can be really challenging at times. And there were plenty of times when you know when you go through production and things are challenging, and you've got a team of people there on set to sort of help you and support you through it, and you know um, get through the the either mental blocks or when things aren't going right. And then when you get into post production. Sometimes you're by yourself or, you know, you, you feel lonely in the, in the edit suite there and you get all the way through the, the, to the end of it. And then you go through the whole slog of trying to get the movie out there and sell it. And a lot of times you feel by the, by the time it's wrapping up or that it's over that you don't ever want to do it again. But then a week goes by and you're like, I got to pick up a camera and go and shoot something like now. Um, And I guess that's kind of the definition of an insanity. Uh, But I think we're just going to keep on doing that. Yeah, I, I think I would say too, and I think this comes through in a lot of the special features that we that we put on to for the the do something with your life package is that yes, we made all these mistakes and we made we learned all these lessons and we have all this advice for young filmmakers or whoever's gonna start out on, on their first feature about plan for this, plan for that, don't forget about distribution. But at the end of the day, Buckle down and make your movie. That's the most important thing. Just get it done. Uh, And there will be times along the way where you feel completely exhausted or defeated or whatever. The key to getting over that is to find good collaborators. And that's, I think, this movie is a testament to that. Um, Darren and I have worked with the same people over and over again for the past, you know, eight years that we've known each other. And I'd say to, to anybody getting into this, make sure you have a team because you can't do it by yourself. And so I would say to put a button on this conversation, I'd just say thanks to everybody that helped us make do something with your life or any of those other projects that we talked about because we couldn't have done it without any of them. Yeah, and uh, you know that, that's a great point too. Is you have to build a team. You have to have a team. I know we can all, we all like to think of ourselves now as like a one man army. We can you know film, edit, cast, write, all this other stuff, and then finally it's like, oh my god, how did I get involved in all? This? You know, if only, if only I had some help. Uh, yeah, yeah it, totally. It, it just you know, I, and I've been there myself where I've tried to do everything and just like. It just over – it consumes you and overwhelms you and then you're like, you know, maybe there is something to this whole teamwork thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, sure. I mean I love doing a little bit of everything. You know, I, 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 I like picking up a camera. I, I'll, I like doing sound work and I like doing all these different things but it's impossible to do everything at once and you, you know, I think you, you build that team around you that can support you and, and people that you want to work with. That's the other big challenge is, you know, there's plenty of egos and whatnot but when you find the people that you want to work with and you can continue to work together, you know, and find a rhythm uh, – for making your production days or, you know, coming up with great ideas for, for stuff, then, um, it just becomes, it's not work. It's all fun. Well, I mean, film, film's a team sport, right? And I think the, the, you know, to use a sports analogy, you know, when, when you're down by a couple goals and you look down the bench, you want to see people that are going to go to battle for you. And I think, uh, that's the most important part because you're going to reach that point where you feel like you're defeated. Um, particularly when you're, when you're like you're saying, Dave, doing a lot of stuff and at the center of everything. So, you know, being able to look over at somebody who's in the trenches with you, I think is really, really important. You know, I, I can tell you're from Canada because you went right to that hockey analogy. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big hockey player. Bob plays a lot of hockey. I, I do my best, yeah. Represent the Canadian way. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, where can people find you at online? 
Uh, uh, we're we're kind of all over, I guess. We've got um, the the Borrow Time Films Facebook page is Facebook slash Borrow Time Films. Uh, the movie uh, Do Something with Your Life is available at www.dosomethingmovie.com. And then, other than that, Twitter is probably the best way to find us. I'm at Bob underscore Woolsey, and uh, Borrow Time Films is at Borrow Time Films. And I'm at D Borrow Time. <laughs> And uh, I will have those all in the show notes, everybody. So you can uh, you can stalk Bob and Darren all day long. And uh, <laughs> but, no, but uh, he's always on social media. So if you tweet at him, he'll probably get back to you within about ten minutes. Uh, well, let's not get too carried away. No, that's, fifteen. He promises. 15. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we you know we like connecting with with other people and and hearing other people's stories, um, especially when it comes to indie filmmaking and and uh, there's. There's, there's a lot of other great stories and other people making really great films out there, and um, I want to see more of them. I'm thinking about, in January, setting a challenge of watching only independent films, like possibly not necessarily going to the theater, but just looking around and finding stuff that I've never heard of and watching just brand new stuff for an entire month and see what that's like. Well, there you go. If you, if you have an indie film, send it to Darren. Yeah. Send me your films. I want to watch stuff I've never heard of and never seen. Well, there you go. Uh, like we were saying before the show, I always get uh, uh, people hitting me up for that stuff. So I will start singing them your way, sir. And awesome. uh, you'll be like, God, I'm so sorry I ever heard of this Dave Bullis guy. Oh, no, movies. <laughs> I'll stop going to work and I'll just, just watch movies all day. It sounds terrible. <laughs> you'll become an agoraphobic and just, you know. <laughs> ah, right. No. <laughs> uh, everyone, you can always find me at DaveBullis.com and Twitter. It's at Dave underscore Bullis. Again, everything we've talked about, I'm going to have in the show notes. So it'll be very easy to navigate through this entire interview. Uh, again, guys, Bob, Darren, I want to say thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. It's been great. Much appreciated. Oh, my pleasure, guys, and I wish you the best. Cheers. Take Thanks. care, bud. Bye bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast. Thank you.